Now, I know before that I mentioned that Anaconda is the most, you know, iconic and well-known animal horror movie out there, and I may have misspoken just because I have my, you know, reptile and snake-centered brain. There's one that is just the most iconic movie out there, I think, and maybe in the running period up there with Star Wars. It's a movie that literally changed the way films are made, produced, and shown from the time it got made back in the 70s moving forward. It's had a huge impact in the film industry as well as with real world consequences that we'll get into into that. And that, if you guys haven't quite caught on yet, is Jaws. So Jaws, everyone knows that movie. Even if you haven't actually seen the movie, you still know Jaws, right? So in this movie, a town on, you know, sitting in New uh, sitting on the East Coast is terrorized by a giant great white shark that, you know, over the course of a week or two just goes through and eats, you know, a couple dozen people, breaks, you know, pulls down boats and does all these crazy things. And then, you know, as Jaws 2, 3 and all that other stuff, there may or may not be like psychic connections and children of Jaws and all this crazy stuff. But we'll just stick with the original movie Jaws, right? So the events of Jaws are actually inspired by real life events, which is kind of where the guy who made the book and then it was, you know, written as a screenplay that was taken on by Steven Spielberg. There were actually a series of events of attacks back in 1916 off of New Jersey. And this is 100% correct. Over, you know, the span of, I think, a couple of weeks, there were, sorry, I'm looking down. Um, there were, I think, five or six attacks that all took place between, like, the pool outside of a hotel and even several miles up a creek, up a Matawan Creek um, in the New Jersey area. And so because of, like, the series of the events and scientists looking back and tracking, like, weather and ocean patterns all the way back that, because they have the ability to do so now, they think what it was was it was a bull shark or a couple bull sharks that were responsible for most, if not all, of the attacks, specifically the one up Matawan Creek, because bull sharks have the ability to go into freshwater, that were responsible for all of the attacks because there was weird stuff going on with the weather and with the oceans and things that was happening that essentially kind of created this nexus of opportunity or ability where these bull sharks all kind of gathered around. And so, you know... In general, there aren't that many shark attacks worldwide. And obviously, with the videos that we're showing that what we did when we went down and did the cage dive with these sharks, there aren't any super aggressive man-eater sharks, you know, for the most part. And yes, there's quite a few different ones out there, but it's like, you know, great whites, bull sharks, tiger sharks, hammerheads, makos, um, like that's most of them. And there are a few other ones like oceanic white tips and blue sharks, um, but for the most part, that's pretty much makes up the vast majority of shark attacks and shark attack fatalities. And even then, there's only about 80 per year, which when you compare to something like a dog attack or being stung by bees or being killed by deer with vehicular, you know, accidents, it's nowhere near in that ballpark. And most of those are provocated by, you know, spear fishermen people baiting and diving and chumming the water where they bring those predators in. So, man, really not that dangerous, as you also will we have to remember that we are going into their realm, right? Like, there's no such thing as a rogue shark. We're the rogue people because we have these. We do this, right? We're going into the place where these don't do a whole lot of good. So we're going into the place where... Other than, you know, the Oreo murder dolphin, those are the apex predators of the sea, right? And so you know, we just kind of have to remember and think about that, you know, where and we're not going to have interactions with sharks unless we put ourselves in their realm. And so even then, you just need to remember to give the animal their respect and, you know, show them that you're not a prey item and give them the space and respect that they deserve. So, for instance, when we did an open water dive over in Hawaii a couple of years ago, we came across a couple of Galapagos sharks, but we had, you know, the chance of running into a tiger shark or even a hammerhead while we were there. And the big thing they remember, they reminded us is the same thing with any other predator, which is, you know, Make sure that you know that they know that we are there. Maintain that eye contact. You keep visual on them that whole time when they come in. They are aware of that. They're a predator. They want an easy ambush, you know, an easy ambush of a meal. 
And so if they're aware of that, there might be a struggle, might be a fight, they might not be able to do it, so they are less inclined to do anything about that. Again, putting yourself into their world, right? So with that being said, do great white sharks, because you know, that's the thing about Jaws, but obviously these amazing cool animals and sharks that we have here, which, you know, that's the sandbar, the black tip, the zebra shark, and then the green sawfish, um, and then the sand tiger was that big slow moving one. Um, those, these are all fairly docile sharks with the black tip reef shark being the most aggressive, right? Um, and even then they don't even achieve a lot of the size that the other ones get too. So you don't really have to worry too much about them. Even if we did like an open dive in there, they probably wouldn't mess with us. And you know, the, those, the open water dive in Hawaii or that aren't the first time that I've been in the water with sharks and I'm still walking around with all my hands and legs, right? Um, but that being said, they're, you know, the jaws that are going through and attacking multiple times. So when earlier, when I talked about the true inspiration of jaws, where it was like one, maybe two sharks attacking multiple times out of all of recorded history that we knew that sharks were, you know, potentially man eaters. There's only ever been two recorded cases. One of which was being the inspiration for jaws of a single shark hanging around and attacking multiple people in that same small time frame. So that's it. So the odds of having a shark come in and hang out and just, you know, terrorize a town or a beach, incredibly unlikely. And I mean, like literally the odds are inconceivable that that would be an, something that would happen, even in places where there are large populations of bull sharks, great white sharks and things like that along, you know, South Africa, California, the East Coast of the United States, parts of Australia. Even then, you don't really have to worry about like a single rogue shark. And again, no such thing as a rogue shark. But with that being said, there is actually another bit of true information that is said in Jaws. And that is said by Quint. So we all know that Quint, he's the guy that, you know, he's the, the tough guy that'll get that shark and he'll do it for 5,000 or whatever it was. Well, he was a survivor, a sailor that survived the sinking of the USS Annapolis during World War II. So that's actually a real event. And what he says, those numbers are also correct. So the USS Annapolis during World War II was hit by a Japanese submarine torpedo and it did go down. And I'm gonna look down just for a second to make sure that I'm gonna tell you my number is absolutely correct. After the ship went down, about 900 sailors survived the sinking of the Indianapolis. And then of those, after four days and five, after five, yeah, uh, five days and four nights, out of those 900-ish sailors, only 317 remained. That's it, until they were finally rescued. And what they think happened was they fell victim to obviously you no know, dehydration, exposure, fatigue, things like that, but to oceanic white tip sharks. So... Sharks and, you know, we've all watched Shark Week, myself included, best week of the year, right? Sharks have the ability to sense vibration in the water through this Amphorae of Lorazini, that lateral line that goes across the sides of their bodies. That picks up the vibrations in the water. And so that's why they can be attracted to the sinking of ships, because it mimics, you know, a prey item that could be moving around and struggling, which makes for an easy meal. And so that's why what happens is when a boat goes down or there's big things that happen in the water, sharks will come in to see what it is. They're not necessarily looking for food. They just know that there's something in the water around them and they want to go and check it out what that is. And so in the case of oceanic white tips, they are usually more solitary, open water, like in between like around the Atlantic and Pacific open water hunters that are usually solitary. But when something like that happens, multiple animals will come in and around at the same time. And after learning a bit more about the oceanic white tip behavior, we have learned that what will happen is, you know, after the immediate like disturbance of the water goes down and it starts to settle down, the, the sharks will come in just to kind of see what that is. They have fairly good sense of smell. Up close, they have okay-ish eyesight, but they can really, you know, they have the, that vibration sense and they'll go in, they'll smell the people, potentially some of them are injured, they'll smell the blood in the water, and they'll just kind of come in and check it out and they'll circle and not actually touch any of them. And then they may bump them a little bit. That's a lot of things that happen to people who work with sharks and people who research them. They find that, you know, they don't have hands, they don't have feet, they have a face. That's how they interact with the world, right? And so they'll bump into something to see what it is if it's not something that they're not sure what it is. And then they may take an exploratory bite. 
And then if they decide it's food, then they may decide to hold on to it. They'll do that with, you know, a dead whale. They'll do that with a struggling tuna. It might happen with, unfortunately, a sailor that sort of survived the sinking of the USS Annapolis. And so with that, we see these kind of things that end up inspiring a little bit of more fear in people because then now you have two real world events that inspired this very scary, dramatic movie, Jaws, right? And so what happened after that was a huge influx of shark hunting, not just for shark fin soup or, you know, using in traditional Eastern medicine, but just for the sport of shark hunting took off after Jaws came out that summer in 19, the 1970s to where over 70% of the world shark populations have been declined because of purely hunting and fishing. And now most shark fishing, sport fishing has definitely gone down, but now we have bycatch in from fishing, which happens when, you know, and also as well for the shark fin, for like shark fin soup, where they'll put out huge miles long lengths of drag nets in hopes of catching, you know, game fish for us to eat. But a lot of bycatch comes up with that too. Sea turtles, dolphins, endangered species, as well as hundreds of species of sharks. And I'm going to get a little bit on my platform here if you couldn't tell already, but... You know, as I mentioned before, about 80-ish attacks on humans, over half of which are started by us, that's what it is about a year. Whereas, on the other hand, over 100 million sharks are caught and then, you know, unalived by us every single year, either through intentional sport fishing, shark fin fishing, or through bycatch. And so, clearly, sharks aren't, like, the biggest, scariest, baddest things on the planet and even in the water they're not as seen before the you know oreo murder dolphin that just like to terrorize everything because they can and that's really about it but with that being said so just to kind of keep a little you know a little mindful about that you know jaws sharks the ocean yeah it's a big kind of intimidating place but just like with all of the animals that we're going to talk about this month and wild animals and animals in general you just have to remember just give them their space. Give them the respect they deserve, just like people deserve respect too, right? And so hopefully you enjoyed this video. Again, I got a little preachy there at the end, and obviously I'm talking about Jaws, and I can't go out cage fishing or uh, shark diving and cage you know, diving with great whites like in Mexico or anything right now. But hopefully you enjoyed some really cool video image of these amazing animals. Hopefully you enjoyed the video today. You know, you know, fact, you know, they are apex predators. They can do that. They do eat people. These events did happen. But fiction, there's no such thing as a rogue shark. Sharks don't hang around and eat people. They're not as deadly as we all think. And they're absolutely amazing, wonderful parts of the ecosystem that we need sharks on the planet for us to. So again, hopefully you enjoyed the video. Stay tuned for more, you know, animal horror movie, fact versus fiction, myth busting, and everything like that for the rest of this month. Hope you have a great day, and we'll check you next time.